Uh, the elephant in the room is a major controversy everybody knows about, but no one is willing to discuss. Like our national debt. It's large, it's getting larger, and everybody knows that the only way to make a difference on it is to attack uh, the entitlements, but nobody wants to discuss it. Now, the elephant in the room in many churches, I believe, is facing our fears of generosity. Why are we afraid? One reason we're afraid, I believe, is because we're afraid we won't be able to meet our other obligations. You say, if I give generously to God, how will I pay my, <clears throat> my mortgage or my insurance premiums or my medical bills or my credit cards? How did we get so deep in debt? I think it all started when credit got so easy. And now we're to the point where just about every store has a credit card. Would you like to save 10% right today? Take our credit card. And then, you know, you put it on credit, another one on credit, and all of a sudden it piles up and it gets to a point where you, you can't pay it off. Now the reason we have fears of generosity is we're afraid God won't keep his promises to provide for us. The Bible's filled with promises about generosity. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. As Solomon says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So Solomon says, if you give God the first part of your income, he will bless you. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about managing money. And uh, to summarize it real quickly, I call it God's triple play. Give, save, spend. Spend, he, say, he says, we are to live joyfully within God's current provision. We're not to jack up our lifestyle using credit. A save, put aside a part of all of our earnings for emergencies in our later years. Solomon writes, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? He says, if when your income goes up, if all you do is increase your lifestyle and you don't increase your margin, what's the advantage? You just get to see money go through your fingers faster. So here's my uh, a tip. Have your savings taken out of your pay automatically. You won't miss it. Just goes into a 401k or whatever, you never see it. The third is give. I honor God by giving the first tenth of what I earn to God's kingdom causes. I want to focus today on the give part. I've seen a lot of things advertised on television, uh, a product, and they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. Wow. If you're not completely satisfied, send it back in 30 days and we'll give you all your money back. God does the same thing. Malachi 3, he says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Tithes refers to the tenth. Offerings is beyond that. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. This is one of the most amazing offers in the Bible. It's greater than any 30-day money-back guarantee you've seen today. It's unique because God is making the offer. He gives the tithe challenge. He says, don't just take my word for it. Run an experiment. You give to me and see if I don't. Get supernaturally involved in your finances and meet your needs. The offer, give generously and trust God to supernaturally meet your needs. They say if you want to know something, ask an expert. And that's what the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians 8 to 9. I want to look at this passage with you today. If you'd like to follow along in the Bibles we provide under the seats in front of you, it's on page 1,161. Paul says, if you want to know about generous giving, look at the Macedonians. 
The Macedonians are the Philippians, Thessalonians, and Bereans, three churches that Paul planted. They were poor. They were in a deep economic dive, and, uh, but when they learned about the plight of the Jerusalem Jewish Christians, the Jews ran Jerusalem, and they hated Christians. And so they made it very difficult for Christians to get jobs. So if you're a Christian living in Jerusalem, you had a tough time financially. And when the Macedonians heard about them, they said, we want to give to help. And Paul says, well, you don't have any money. Oh, don't cut us out of this deal. We want to help them. From the Macedonians, I find four things we learn about giving generously and trusting God to supernaturally meet our needs. One, giving is voluntary. 2 Corinthians 8, 1, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. See, they were having tough times financially. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and beyond their ability, entirely on their own. This was voluntary. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people in Jerusalem. In verse 8, Paul says, I am not commanding you. This is voluntary. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, he says, Each should give what you have decided in your heart to give. You decide. It's voluntary. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a willing giver. Paul is a freedom theologian. He preserves our freedom in this matter of giving. Although 10% is suggested by Old Testament writers and Jesus, Paul never suggests an exact amount. It's a decision you make. There's no real grading system on giving. It's like PE class in high school. You're pretty much guaranteed a passing grade just for having a body. Jeff Mannion, in his book, uh, Satisfied, tells about Rick and Carla, who were having dinner with their friends James and Lori, and they, James and Lori were lamenting how costs were spiraling on their uh, potential adoption, and it looked like it was going to price them out, and they wouldn't be able to adopt a second child. Rick and Carl tried to offer their sympathy and encouragement to them. The next day at work, Rick had a thought come into his mind that they should help James and Lori with their adoption. He thought it would just be a fleeting thought, but it, it just wouldn't leave. He just kept thinking about it all through the day, and he began to wonder if this is what people mean when they talk about a prompting from the Holy Spirit, a, a leading uh, from God. He, he wondered if God was nudging him. Now, Rick and Carla love to live carefully and to save money. Rick loved to see their savings compound. If they were to give to help their friends, that would move their savings in the wrong direction, backward. Eventually, uh, the, the, the thought kind of got out of his mind because he had so many sales meetings and emails and phone calls to make. Anyway, they were already giving generously to their church, and uh, they had their own financial goals. When he got home that night, he was doing some more emails and trying to watch a ball game on TV, and Carla walked into the room, grabbed the remote, and pressed mute. That was her signal that she wanted to talk. She said, I've been thinking. She started tentatively that maybe God wants us to help James and Lori with their adoption. Rick looked at her in disbelief and then confessed that he had had the same thought. The fact that they both had the thought separately and independently increased their suspicion that God may be leading them. And so they turned off the ball game and to begin a conversation that could be a very expensive one. They realized that this wasn't going to just be a nominal gift. This might be the largest check they had ever written. And uh, they were... Uh, in doing that, they were experiencing, uh, anytime you do something like that, it's not just a matter of, of giving like regularly to the church or to help friends out, but it's an effort, it's an uh, act of trusting God. They gave voluntarily. 
Nobody made them give. It was God-directed. So let me give you one tip on this whole giving thing. This could be the most important one there is. Ask God what He wants you to give. And then listen to what He says. The second thing I think we learned from the Macedonians is giving emanates from, our, from giving ourselves first to Christ. Verse 5, And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. The Macedonians gave themselves first to the Lord. In verse 9 we read, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. Jesus left heaven, His glory in heaven, became a human being, lived a life of poverty, and died on the cross for our sins. Out of gratefulness for what He did for us, His love for us, we want to give back to Him. When I was in graduate school in Chicago, I uh, devoted about 48 hours a week to my, I always took full loads, to my, stu- my classes and studying. And then I led a Young Life Club, and I devoted about 25 hours a week to that. So my life was already pretty full with just those two things. I didn't have a lot of extra time. But then I met Jory. Suddenly I had time for long walks and leisurely dinners and talks past midnight on the phone. How did I do that? I was in love. When we love Christ, when we're so grateful for what He's done for us, we long to give back to Him. So if, you, if you're wondering how you, you do this whole giving thing, you first give your life to Christ. You say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins and were raised from the dead. Come into my life. I want to uh, give you my life and everything. It's all yours. Then it gets easier to give to Him. The third thing I think we learn from the Macedonians is giving is an investment. In a very famous verse, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. The farmers uh, understood this. If a farmer was was sowing seed for the the year, he wouldn't say, well, we're a little tight on finances. I think I'll, I'll scrimp a little bit on seed. Well, if he did that, then he would have less of a harvest. Farmers understood that sowing seed was an investment. Like sowing, giving is not something that you throw away. It's an investment in God. Jesus says, Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor vermin vermin destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. When we give to God, we're not giving it away. We're investing in heaven. We're investing in the future. Giving tempers our desire for more. Some people make the mistake of thinking that since they don't have much in the way of income that they can't give. This is probably the number one pushback I hear from people. I say, you know, I'd love to give to God, but I've got so, I'm so slammed with bills and my, my income's so stable. You know, the math just doesn't work. If God wants me to give, He's going to have to send a lot more money my way. If I was rich, I'd give. Let me tell you, if you're waiting until you're rich to give, you're going to be waiting a long time. An economist named H.F. Clark talks about, based on a lot of research, what he calls the 25% rule. Ask people, you know, how are you and when would you feel rich? If I had 25% more. And then when they get to the new level, how are you doing? Well, if I just had 25% more. And then when they get to that new level, if I could just have 25% more. How wealthy do you have to be where, where, where you finally feel rich? And he says nobody's ever reached that level. George Gallup has found the same thing. He calls it his double rule. Ask a person who's earning 60000 what would it take for you to feel rich? He said, if I earned 120000 Ask a person earning 100,000, what would it take if I was earning 200,000? Ask a person who has 500,000, what would it take for you to feel rich if I just had a million dollars? 
Ask a person who has a million, if I just had two million, if they have five million, if I just had 10 million, Gallup says it's always the same. We want double. Then we'll be okay. By the way, who's happier, a multimillionaire or a man with nine kids? <laughs> well, most of you know we have nine kids, right? The answer is the man with nine kids because he doesn't want any more. All right, the last thing I think we learned from the Macedonians is giving invites God to become supernaturally involved in our finances. This is my main point. You give generously and trust God to supernaturally meet your needs. If you give generously to God and you don't have a lot of resources and you have many other obligations, there's only one way you can do it. You have to trust God and His promises. You say, God, I can't do this without you. I can't give back to you the first part of my income. I'll never make it. I need you to get involved supernaturally with me or it won't work. That's exactly the offer Paul makes. 2 Corinthians 9, 8-11. And God is able, these are great verses. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. He's saying if you give generously, God will supply your needs and even increase what you have and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. He says, if we give generously to him, he will stretch the remainder. He will expand it so we can meet even more needs. If we trust him with our finances, God makes it his mission to become supernaturally involved in blessing and protecting our finances. Generous giving then becomes an adventure in obedience to God and then watching him supernaturally provide. God says, I like the way you're handling your money. You're saving you're not spending crazy, you're living within your means, and you're giving to me, and you're generous with other people. I can see that I'm first priority in your life, so I'm going to hook you up to my supernatural supply. I can give you more because I see I can trust you with it. Deuteronomy, De Deuteronomy 29.5 is an amazing verse. The Lord says, during the 40 years I led you through the wilderness. He's talking to the Israelites who spent 40 years in the wilderness, Sinai basically. Your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. I mean, that's a miracle. I know thousands of Christians who testify that when they decided to do this and give God the first part of their income, the beginning of the month, that they saw miracles in their lives. God got involved in their lives financially. A single mother with three young kids told the wife of her pastor, I know God wants me to tithe, but you know I don't even have enough money to live on as it is. But I've decided I'm just going to do it regardless. That's how it's done. Bill Hybels, in his book Simplicity, has us imagine two guys, let's call them Mike and Jim, they both became Christians about the same time. They were good friends. They both uh, grown up as Christians together. But Mike had a little more confidence in God's provision. Uh, Jim, not so much. Jim came to him one day and says, Mike, I need to get from A to B financially. In order to do that, I need 100% of my income. I've done the math. The calculations work. I need 100%. Well, Mike has read the Bible and God's promises about giving, and he needs to get from A to B financially too. But he thinks he can get there on 90% of his income. Because Scripture says you give God the, the first tenth, and he will take care of you with the remaining 90%. He believes that God can not only get him from A to B, but he can also get him from B to C. C is a place the Bible describes as a place of favor, a place of blessing. And uh, 
So he, uh, he, he trusts God for that. He doesn't know what C is going to look like. But he has a pretty good hunch it's going to be a lot more exciting than the A to B plan. And uh, he wants to sign up for this place of favor. I mean, anybody I know who's, 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 who's taken on this faith-filled uh, plan uh, has C stories to tell you. Stories of God's uh, providing from some unusual source, a surprise, extra provision from someplace, maybe uh, a promotion at work, maybe a new job. And so Mike says, that's what I want to live, the B to C life. Now, the most fascinating thing to me about these two guys is both of them think the other guy is an idiot. Jim looks at Mike and says, you think you're going to get from A to B on 90%? I tell you, I've done the math. It won't work. You're an idiot. And Mike looks at Jim and says the same thing, maybe a little nicer. But he says, you know, yeah, you can get from A to B, and I think I'm going to get from A to B too. But you're never going to learn about B to C. That's the place where all the excitement is. Where God says he'll pour his blessings on you in his favor and be supernaturally involved in your finances. I'm telling you, man, what you sign up for A to B, that's boring. Big deal. That's what everybody signs up for. I want to be in a place of God's favor. Sign me up for the B to C life anytime. So which kind of idiot do you want to be? The faith-filled idiot? Like Mike? I've been that kind of idiot. Jory has with me ever since we began earning wages. I would never go back to anything less. Let me ask you, at what point in your life will you finally drive down a stake in the ground and say, sign me up for the B to C life? The first tenth goes to God by faith. You give generously to God and trust God to supernaturally supply your needs. I'll give you a free tip. Do it electronically. You just sign it up. It happens automatically. You never miss it. I mean, Jory and I make this decision in, in January. We never talk about it again. I feel so strongly that if you give generously to God, that He will meet your needs and maybe even increase your store so you can give to even more needs, that we're offering you the three-month tithe challenge. Works like this. You say, okay, I'm going to give God the first tenth of my income. Or if, if a tenth is too big a gulp for you, then at least get started doing something. Maybe it would be 5%. You say, I'll take the challenge and if in three months you're not completely satisfied that God has gotten involved and helped you meet your other obligations and shown favor on you in some way, you send me an email and we'll send your three months' money back. No questions. So, Micah, come on up here. I want you to show us a little bit about how we can do this. I mean, I think everybody here knows they can put money in the offering. Uh, everybody probably knows they can write a check, drop it in, or they mail it in. But tell us about other ways we can give and how we can do this three-month tie challenge on our website. All right. So we do have a website, and I don't know if any, how many of you have gone to it, but uh, the most common way people look for a church nowadays is by looking up the website or the Facebook page. And so that's one of the main reasons that we have a website, but we also do it to uh, inform you guys on what's com coming up. Uh, what's going on, and also remind ourselves why are we here, why do we join together, who we are. Um, you can listen to the sermons uh, online on the website. A lot of people do that, which is great. And you have links to the videos as well. Uh, there's a nice picture of Ron. He's, he's, Whoa, he's, yeah. I better take a look. Oh, goodness. <laughs> we can do better than that, I hope. <laughs> <clears throat> Face of our church right there. All right. Yes. Uh, and on that toolbar all the way to the right, there's a Give Online button that walks you through the process. It's really easy. Um, you click uh, Give Now, and you can go through it. Now, if you are like me, 
then that plate being passed, passed on a Sunday morning does nothing because uh, how often do I have cash in my wallet? Very rarely. If I have any, it's like $2. And uh, how often do I have a checkbook on my person? Even less. So I think I've written a total of less than 100 checks in my life. And uh, so if you're a millennial or um, clinging on to the, the digital age, then checks are, are old and cash is getting old too, although I still like it. Um, but this is so much easier if I can go online, do it digitally, set it to where it comes out automatically. You can, uh, you click on there, it's really easy to walk through. I did uh, the online version through our website this week just to try it out. Um, there's also an app, uh, same page, you scroll down, you see it's called Give Plus. Go ahead and go to that last slide, uh, David. Uh, this is on your smartphone, Apple or Android. Uh, super easy to go on there to create an account and set it up multiple times uh, or one-time gifts. Uh, it's really easy. So we have these tools here to help you give if, there, if there's any hindrance, uh, um, if you're not a plate passer person uh, like me, then this is so much easier. And, uh, um, and then you can also do the tithe challenge on there, right? Yep, there's a link on that same page to the tithe challenge, three month tithe challenge, get you started there. Um, other ways you can give would be uh, with our address. We actually set ours up through our bank. Uh, you can send a check here automatically, things like that. Um, so easy. There we have a lot of options. So if you have any questions to go through this, give a call to the office. I'm in the office Tuesday and Wednesday while we're still moving up here. I'm still living in Springfield and commuting. Um, but be happy to walk you through this, either sitting down at a computer or talking you over it, uh, through it on the phone. Uh, we'll help you any Anything that's hindering you, we would like to, to solve that problem. Um, just to make it, if you have that desire to give, that you can give however you need to. So the thing I like the best about the three-month challenge, tithe challenge, is if they're not satisfied at the end of three months that God has shown them favor, helped them meet their other obligations, that Micah will personally pay you back. <laughs> that's the part I like the best. Thanks, Micah. I'm still Micah. looking through the job description for that one. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for some uh, uh, verses we've looked at today about you wanting to be involved in our finances. You care about every aspect of our life. And uh, many of us today want to invite you in to become miraculously involved with their uh, finances. So I want to give you an opportunity to respond to God. I think it's important when we hear from his word that we respond in some way. Would you, would you tell him what you heard today? Maybe uh, you want to tell them, confess your fears. You're deathly afraid of being generous and you won't have enough left. Tell him that. Uh, maybe you want to stick your toe in the water and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to start giving regularly to you. I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm inviting, I need your help. Or maybe you're going to take the tithe challenge and uh, tell him that. And so I'm just going to go for it, even though I, I, I'm scared. Uh, t respond to God right now in prayer. Lord God, thank you for sending your son who gave up his glory in heaven to become a man, to die for us. And out of love, we respond to you and want to give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. 